information. Obviously, the, the key issues for today's meeting are the Department and briefing on the draft programme for government, 2021 outcome 7. A departmental briefing on the proposed LCM for the Private International Law Implementation Agreements of Agreements Bill. A written briefing on a draft consultation pilot scheme on simplifying the legal aid approval process for engagement of expert witnesses in family proceedings in the magistrates' courts, and a written briefing on a draft consultation on proposals for new <coughs> organised crime offences. Um, so, just to remind members, if you don't already have your phone switched off, please switch them off or put them on silent or airplane mode. Um, and just to remind you that we are now in public session. Okay. And Hansard will be taking a record of our, our oral evidence sessions. Just first item of business, I'd just like to welcome Emma as our new committee member. Emma has replaced Martina Anderson on the Justice Committee. Um, so welcome to your first Justice Committee meeting. Thank you very much. Hopefully you'll last a wee bit longer than Martina. <laughs> <laughs> what did we do? We'll just do on our house. What did you just do? What was the bad? So disappointing. We're actually really nice, Emma. <laughs> so, just um, do members have any interest to declare? No. And um, we have apologies from Paul Gibbon and Patsy McGlone. We don't have any other apologies at this stage. So, agenda item two then are draft minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of March 2020. The <coughs> minutes are on pages five to eight of your pack. Are members? Content. Agreed. That's a true reflection. Okay. Agreed. Okay. So then our next agenda item then is the forward work programme from March 2020. So there's an updated forward work programme on pages 10 to 13 of your meeting pack. Just to let members know, the Department has asked the Committee to schedule an oral evidence se session on the provisions of the Domestic Abuse Bill for the meeting on the 19th of March, that's next Thursday. So to accommodate this, um, to reschedule the oral evidence session on the proposal for the LCM for Criminal fin Finances Act from the 19th of March to the meeting on the 26th of March, is that correct? Yeah. So are members content that we do that? Good. Obviously, we had asked for the domestic abuse bill to be brought forward as quickly as possible, so I think that um, just to advise members then, page four of your table pack, you will see that the department has, officials have requested an opportunity to update the committee at next week's meeting on the department's coronavirus planning and outline um, what they're going to be, what they intend to do. So the, the department have asked that this be done in private session, and I would like to take members' views in relation to that. My instinct is that there may well be particular issues that might have to be taken in private session, and again, that's for members to take a position on. Um, but. I think I would prefer, given that there's a public interest around this, that I think giving people information actually very often can reduce panic. Um, I understand concerns around not wanting to cause any heightened concerns, but I think if people are given information in the correct way, then that can actually often reduce concerns rather than heighten them. So I would like to take members' comments in relation to it. Chair, Ch I, I agree, I totally, absolutely agree with you. I think it has to be in public session, um, unless they give us the, the reason why it's not going to be in public session, um, or, or indeed if we can do part of it in public session and, and any of those bits they don't want, we can maybe then then, then go private. But I, I think the principle of it need to be in public session, I think it's really, really important. If I would like to add as well, is that I think this is so serious now and I'd wonder if there should be a request to the, to the Justice Minister to come for that briefing, um, who, who heads this up, because I think 
Um, justice in, in this whole piece uh, on Corona and COVID-19 is kind of slightly missed, but, it, but it's really going to affect us in regards to our prisons, in regards to powers to the, the, the police and various other things. And I think it, it might be worth calling for the, for the Minister to come, um, if possible, Boris. I don't, I don't have any issues with, with at least requesting that the no. Minister um, comes. I'm just wondering, and you might be able to give me some advice, Christine, and yeah. Mary, how, how we would address this. If, obviously, this is a very evolving situation, mm -hmm. and is next Thursday going to be too late for us that getting a briefing? I mean, is is there the possibility for an urgent briefing if that was necessary? We, is can, there, ask, I mean, we can ask the department um, to bring it forward, and we can arrange it. And then can arrange no, I'm not saying we necessarily need to, but it, mm -hmm. can we at least have the conversation with them to say if things evolve quicker? Because we obviously all in this room don't know how quickly it might evolve, and it may not. And the department will have a better idea of that than we will have. So they may be able to come back and say, look, I don't think that's going to be an issue. But at least if we can just have okay. um, flagged up with them that if there's a need for a more urgent briefing, that we can have it. Are, are members content, Paul? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I. Yeah, I think we need to be agile on this, and because it's so fast moving, even with the news uh, with regards to the the Republic, what they have moved uh, today uh, towards. So yes, I think that we should be have the capability to meet maybe on Monday, maybe Monday morning, whatever, uh, to get briefing uh, if need be. But uh, I'm I'm I think that it's a two-edged sword with regards to the private. Briefing. I think they, there may well be some stuff that they want to tell us in private, and by going public totally, then they might not tell us as much as we would like to know. And I simply cite the experience we all had a couple of weeks ago, where they told us that things were at hand, they didn't tell us what was in the hand. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't really want to be going through another evidence session like that again. So maybe we leave a wee bit of flexibility whereby we can go in a closed session and then open. Well, Paul, that's exactly what I am proposing, that we, that we do have um, in what we can have in public session, but that we can also then close for a period of time and, and have a conversation around issues that might be sensitive for all yes. number of reasons. Just, yeah. you know, so I think that, that that is where we should be at. But what we can... What information we can give to the public, I think, should be given yeah. to the public. And really just reassuring them that the information that they're not being given is, is not something that's being hidden from them. It's more just around sensitivity issues. So I, I think that that is exactly what I would be proposing, that we, that we have a mix of both public and private. Because, yes, obviously there would be certain issues that you would can be more frank with in, in a private session. Are members content that that's what we that's how we could move forward? We advise the, the department that we would like it to be in public, but we understand that there are elements of it that would certainly have to be in private, and we're happy for that to to be the case. Yep. And, I, and I'm content either way, whether we do the private first and then public. I, I, I don't have any strong feelings about it. And I'll probably leave it up to the chair, to be fair, because it will be... Um, pre pre uh, previous experience with the committee is we've done it in public, and where there's information or, informa or an issue to be discussed that the officials feel they can't do in public, they indicate, and then we move into closed session and deal with those issues after that, rather than doing it the other way around, because you can start to get into things in closed session that maybe they could do in public, and then you end up having to do them twice. So if we indicate to them that we will do it in public session but where they have information or issues that they feel they can't discuss they need to just they need to say and then there will be a closed session at the at the end to deal with those can i just ask chair i mean could we not ask them what bits they don't want to do in public so we know what the issue is beforehand because like paul i remember the last time we sat here and we we had them in talking about that was a closed session then yeah. That's why they didn't answer anything, because it was a closed session, and they know we could just give out nonsense out. But when it's a public session, when we ask them a question, they know they have to answer. They know it goes out in the public domain, so I, I think we're going to get proper <coughs> answers then. So I would be more inclined to say to them, we understand there may be points that you want to discuss in private. 
tell us what they are. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's, we can do that. Um, yeah. I do think past experience has shown that some you can discuss some things to a certain extent mm -hmm. and then they will indicate that they can't go much further but they might be able to be a bit more open and you might want to add those on but we can ask them, yeah. And are you happy then we ask for the Minister to come if she's available? Um, and we hold and reserve the possibility of doing it on Monday. Um, yeah. And we we'll liaise with them about yeah. it. If, if it's felt necessary that we should do it on Monday, I think that that's should at least be keeping that as an option. The chair might kill me. <laughs> Give it an extra meetings. Um, okay, so we're content that that's how we move forward. Great, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, agenda item four then is the draft programme for government 2021 outcome seven, the department briefing. And I'll just refer members that this is on your packs on page 15 to 36, and in your table pack, page six to eight, is the clerk's memo. Okay. So the department is in the process of developing a draft 2021 PFG outcome seven chapter, which covers we have a safe community where we respect the law and each other. And departmental officials will give us an overview. Now we have Lynn Capper and Jane Holmes. And Lynn is the head of justice performance in the department and Jane is justice performance team. And obviously Hansard will take a record of this part of the meeting. Just want to welcome you and thanks Thank for you. coming to the committee. And I think Lynn's going to give us a bit of an overview and then we'll give you the credit. That's the plan. <laughs> For the first That's bit anyway. um, thank you. But thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to brief the committee uh, <clears throat> on the Outcome 7 chapter of the Programme for Government. Uh, the Department of Justice leads on Outcome 7, and as the Church has said, that is, we have a safe community where we respect the law and each other, but we also contribute to the, to the delivery of other outcomes, for example, Outcome 10. We have uh, created this, a place where we want uh, people to live and work, to visit uh, and invest. I thought it might be useful to give you some background to the programme for government. So you may be aware that from May 2016 to January 2017, the former executive consulted on a different way of doing business to generate a programme for government framework, and then a fuller programme with the aim of providing well-being for all by tackling disadvantage and driving economic growth. As a result, a framework with 12 outcomes supported by 49 individual population indicators was developed and then subsequently used in the NICS Outcomes Delivery Plan. The Outcomes Delivery Plan, or ODP, built on the outcomes-based approach developed by the former executive and enabled departments to take forward outcomes-based working. There have been two editions of the ODP. The first plan was published in June 18, with progress reports in December 18 and September 19. And in December 2019, a new plan was produced with the intention of it being a live document to enable actions to be amended or added to as priorities and initiatives changed. The new decade new approach deal outlines a two-stage approach to establishing a, a new strategic level PFG. This allows progress to be made on immediate priorities, as well as giving ministers an opportunity to engage with citizens and stakeholders in preparation for the co-design of a new PFG. So the executive has agreed that firstly, an immediate PFG will be prepared in April based on an enhanced version of the, of the outcomes delivery plan. This will be updated to reflect the executive's immediate priorities and actions for next year informed by a targeted engagement process. And then secondly, a new strategic PFG will be delivered uh, in April 21, reflecting agreed longer term priorities. This will be informed by citizen and community engagement and co-design and aligned to a multi-year budget and legislative programme. Work on developing the PFG for 2020-21 is underway and outcome owners have been asked to identify and put forward new actions to reflect ministerial priorities. The Outcome 7 chapter is being prepared and we are available to engage further with the committee uh, once that work has been completed and the text of the draft has been agreed by the executive. 
The briefing paper you've received outlines the key strategic areas uh, that are intended to be included in the 2021 Outcome 7 chapter. Um, I'll not list all of those again, as they're hopefully in your papers, but it's worth noting that a common theme is partnership working. Uh, none of the key activities can be achieved by justice alone, and they require close working across government and with other sectors. In line with the outcomes-based accountability approach, it's important that we measure the impact of what we do uh, in three ways. Firstly, how much are we doing? Then, how well are we doing? And thirdly, is anyone better off? And five indicators are used to quantify progress against outcome seven. Uh, so we measure the percentage of the population who were victims of any uh, who were victims of a, a crime via the Northern Ireland Crime Survey. We've got a respect index. Uh, we measure the percentage of the population who believe their cultural identity is respected by society. We measure the average time taken to complete criminal cases. And then finally, the reoffending rate. These are underpinned by a range of supporting performance measures, which are regularly reviewed. And this, together with formal evaluation, is key to ensuring that what we're doing is having the desired impact. The 2020-21 PFG will be a live document and therefore subject to ongoing review and update throughout the year. It's also a precursor to the strategic multi-year PFG. Uh, and as I said, there will be significant engagement to inform what that will look like. The affordability of the proposed Outcome 7 actions will be subject to uh, next year's budget considerations. Uh, but in the meantime, works are going to cost the actions, uh, and this work will be finalised once the PFG and the 2020-21 budget has been agreed. Uh, however, it's worth noting that in the past, the Department has consistently sought to prioritise funding to ensure outcome delivery plans have been fully funded, um, and we'll seek to continue to do that, subject to affordability. So in summary, uh, I hope that's been a helpful overview. Uh, as I mentioned, we're very happy to engage with the committee as the process continues. Uh, and we're also very happy to take any questions you have today. Thank you very much, Glenn. I appreciate you coming to the committee and, and giving that overview. Obviously, I mean, members have an opportunity to, to raise any questions they want now. We will obviously have more questions whenever the draft comes forward. And I think that's the, the point at which maybe um, members might have a, a wee bit more to scrutinise. But just in terms of a, a couple of issues, um, for myself. You see just around the um, crime survey, are you also using the police recorded crime levels to measure outcome seven progress? And if not, why not? Um, I suppose uh, as background, uh, whenever the programme for government outcomes were set up, uh, there was a lot of engagement between departments and NISRA, the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. Um, to ensure that the indicators had really robust measures underneath them. And through that engagement with NISRA, um, the, the, the five indicators that I mentioned for Outcome 7 were the five agreed ones. So formally, they're the ones that we report against when measuring Outcome 7. But for example, uh, the, the survey that you mentioned um, is obviously considered by the department as we look at how we take forward the actions that underpin all of the things that we do. So yes, we take account of all those pieces of information, but the formal indicators in the programme for government um, that have been signed off by NISRA and so on are the, the, the five official ones that you'll see in the document. And are those indicators likely to change in the updated draft? Uh, I think the answer to that is that for the the 2020-21, so for the April probably one, not. those will probably stay the same. But as we look at a longer term programme for government and a multi-year one, um, I have no doubt that as we go through that engagement process, uh, and as we see what's in the new program for government, people will want to reflect on are we measuring the right things. So there may well be an opportunity to reopen the the indicators in that. So just in terms of that, whenever the the draft comes, then really it's for the next. It's for the strategic one that the committee need to be looking at, suggesting maybe that there could potentially be other indicators to be added in. It's it's well, I think yeah. it's only a draft. The chance the opportunity to change the indicators is probably minimal or none? I think for, for the, the short term yeah. next year's one, I think the opportunity to change the five indicators will be relatively small because the, the work needed to set up a new indicator and make sure the baseline data and so on is a pretty fundamental bit of work. 
uh, there will no doubt be an opportunity to, to change maybe some of the actions and so on that are in the, the short term PFG, but certainly for the longer term one, there'll be more opportunity to put in some of those more fundamental changes. Yeah, I was actually going to suggest when we get the, the draft PFG, that's the point at which, because it is the actions then that you probably could have some influence over, but obviously members might have a view of the fact of, of around that not being able to change the indicators now, but it does also give us an opportunity to prepare if we want to get other indicators in as a, as a committee <coughs> or individuals, obviously, um, in terms of getting additional indicators or different indicators into, into that for the strategic. Do any members want to ask any questions in relation to that? Paul? Yes, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, and again, along the same line of questioning as the chairperson here, uh, the five indicators are the same five as the previous or the other draft yeah. uh, programme for government. Uh, whilst I see that as being a consistent trend, uh, no reason why we couldn't add to them if there are decent indicators out there. Uh, I like the style and shape of a programme for government, with the outcomes being very high level, mm. wide reaching, panoramic. Uh, but, but with regards to the example that uh, Linda has given uh, around other statistics and other measuring tools. Why would they not be included? What standard do we need to meet in order that, that something becomes an indicator to a programme for government? Um, I might well have to refer to some of my NISRA colleagues in the Department of Finance to give the technical answer to that. Um, I suppose, having been slightly involved in the preparation of the previous PFG, um, there's an awful lot of statistical rigour given to a, working out how the indicators best reflect the actions and then building up the actual indicator itself. So there's an awful lot of statistical, technical rigour around those. So I don't think it's as easy as saying there's a particular survey we'd like to put in there. But I think back to the Chair's point, those are the sorts of questions um, that we look at as we develop the multi-year one for 20, April 21. Okay. Uh, justice seems to have ownership of... Uh, and responsibility for maybe is a better word of uh, outcome seven. We have a safe community where we respect the law and each other. But surely there are overreaches and connections uh, with others. Uh, how actively do you assess the other, the, the other outcomes that may well have a justice element to it? I think there's a couple of angles to that, and it, it, it sort of works two ways. Um, as, as you rightly say, we lead on outcome seven. Um, but absolutely inherent in delivering Outcome 7 is partnership working with lots of other areas. Um, so we are very actively involved with Department of Health, Department of Communities, or Department for Communities, to name two. Um, and that extends as well to the voluntary and community sector. So in, in terms of the actions that you will have seen, hopefully, in the Outcomes Delivery Plan uh, that rolled into this year, um, I think it's probably fair to say most, if not all, of those involve partnership working. So this isn't just about justice delivering outcome seven. Equally, um, as I mentioned in my opening comments, um, we work actively with the other outcome owners and their networks and mechanisms to, to have that engagement. So, for example, we, we feed into and use the example there of outcome 10. Um, so there are structures and mechanisms for that partnership working to take place, both across government and with um, other sectors. Uh, do any of those discussions and communications raise the issue about budget and how we can overlay a budget over to a programme for government? Yes, um, and that I think is one of those really complicated things um, that, that we need to do more of and, and keep trying to do in a better way. Um, so I suppose within the confines of Outcome 7 and the Department of Justice bit in Outcome 7, um, we continue to work and try and make sure that our budget aligns to the Outcome 7 actions. That's something we did as we developed the Outcomes Delivery Plan. And as the budget is set for next year, we continue to make sure that we mirror and match the budget to uh, the PFG and vice versa. Um, the, the interesting question you raised is across departments. Yeah. Um, and I think the best way that we're trying to do that is through working on individual um, action. So, for example, some of the problem-solving justice initiatives um, around those project tables are the different departments, and we seek, where possible, to try and find ways to co-fund those sorts of things. Have any other departments 
uh, offered up or justified your spend on outcome seven? And, and the fact that, well, okay, you, you, your ownership of outcome seven, so really you need a bit more money and we're prepared to discuss that with you? Are departments having those discussions? We're, we're having the discussions. I'm going to struggle off the top of my head to give you an example of where sort of Somebody money has changed hands. Yeah, yeah. But certainly, um, for example, as we are looking at some of the problem solving justice initiatives, there's that recognition from all departments, not just other departments, <coughs> but the Department of Justice as well, that to do this in the best way and to have the most impact across society that we need to explore those conversations. So the conversations are happening is a a short answer to, to your question. Okay, uh, that's, there's hope there, I suppose. There's hope. Um, with regards to five indicators, and you have it on page um, well, it's 28 of our pack, but it gives you basically a pyramid type style on the boxes. Yes. And there's negative change, there's positive change, and there's no change. Who decides the thresholds and the tolerance levels for no change? Because there are movements. Um, again, that would be a statistical. So, so, so I'm in Israel. Israel. Yeah. So, you know, you, you could lose a whole percentage point, either good, positive or negative, but yet that would be classed as no change. Um, and that, I suppose we look to our, our statistical colleagues who, and I suppose, it, yes, on one hand it's a percentage point, but they will assess in the, uh, in the, the, the wider context of the population that that change is based on, whether that's negligible or not. Okay, and then last question, Chair. Uh, uh, with regards to the... No, I've lost it. Move on, move on. Okay. Thanks. We can come back to you if, if you remember Paul Rachel. Lost it. <laughs> Sorry, Thank folks. Sir. You okay. Thank you. Um, like Linda and Paul, I have a few issues just with the indicators that have been looked at and the glaring ones that are not, um, and certainly look forward to discussions on what others might be relevant to it. But in terms of, you mentioned the uh, robust data collection with NISRA, how were these indicated or <coughs> indicators arrived at in terms of your processes with NISRA and decided on? How were they? Sorry, so I missed how the. Were they, how were the five indicators decided on? Okay, um, and I'm going to turn to Jane, who, who was more involved at the time, uh, to give some more detail. Um, but essentially, we looked at what the actions and initiatives uh, and objectives and outcomes were, um, and through consultation with NISRA, um, I suppose some of this was based on as well what information is available, um, because in order to show change and outcomes changing, we need to have a backlog of data to be able to see movement. Um, so based on what information was available, the robustness of that data, um, those sorts of conversations took place to come up with the indicators. For example, for the average time taken to complete criminal cases, um, we built a new data set to be able to, to have that indicator. And Jane, you want to add to that? Um, the indicators are the are set at population level, so they're underpinned by um, performance um, measurements that you've mentioned, such as um, police recorded crimes, so they don't sit in isolation. Um, and I think the desire at the time was, it was quite a few number of years ago now, was that it would be at have fewer, more um, representative indicators than, than have a whole raft of indicators. Um, and it was reached, it was NISRA who were very much involved in it, and um, I believe that their <coughs> um, special advisors were involved at the time as well. So it was um, a very robust discussion was had, as well as with the department. Okay, thank you. And just in terms of the respect index, what kind of data points are is being used for that kind of compilation? That, that indicator yeah. mainly sits with the executive office. Um, so I, I'll, if you're content, I'll go back to them to get more details on that, because that very much is one that uh, is provided on their side. Yeah, and that was actually one that was part of the data development exercise. It didn't exist um, in, in 2016, and it's been developed since then. Um, no, I just appreciate the amount of work that has to go into um, building an index. I mm -hmm. had to do this in previous life myself. Okay. Um, so certainly very interested in a respect index and, and, and especially for outcome seven and how that could then, uh, if that is potentially to be uh, used by other departments, um, because it would feed into mm -hmm. certainly different um, aspects of life in Northern Ireland, but certainly would welcome any information that you have on, on what that is and what's, what's been fed into it. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly write to you with more details on that if you're content. Thank you. Glenn, Pat. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for coming in. Um, <coughs> Just, uh, am I right in saying that there isn't going to be any consultation on this draft? Um, I think given the timescales involved, uh, that 
the executive um, and the executive office have uh, agreed there's going to be targeted consultation. Um, so suppose, in, in theory, officials coming to, to committees and so on. Um, so given that this is going to be up and running uh, in April, um, it's, it's targeting, targeted engagement with a plan for much uh, more detailed consultation and engagement. I think the term co-design is being used as well for the April 21 um, programme for government. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, in terms of the, the progress against population indicators, um, there hasn't been any considerable positive progress. Uh, in fact, in terms of the average time taken to complete criminal cases, we've seen a, a significant negative change. Does that call into question uh, the delivery plan itself and its uh, suitability to address the problems that are, are faced in the justice system? I don't think so. Um, I think the, and if we look at the, the, the existing outcomes delivery plan, uh, there is a really <coughs> broad suite of ambitious actions in that plan um, that, that seek to tackle the, the key strategic priorities. Um, if I pick on specifically the, the average time to complete criminal cases, because with another hat on, I look after that. Um, and although, as at the last formal measure, 31st of March last year, um, absolutely that indicator had gone in the wrong direction, over the last 12 months, um, based on uh, provisional management information that will eventually turn into published statistical information. We've seen um, quite significant progress in that one, and I think that progress has been un underpinned by the actions that were in the outcomes delivery plan. So I think we're seeing, and if I use that one as an example, those actions that are in the plan starting to bear fruit, and we're turning, using that example again, we're turning the curve on the time taken to complete criminal cases. And, and what about the other indicators? Uh, the other key indi indicators, I suppose, um, similar similar story, um, where there has been uh, a reduction in performance. Um, I think we have recognised that and put in place in the outcomes delivery plan, and will continue to put in place in the PFG um, actions that we think will help improve performance in those. Okay, so the, this information is really quite outdated. Then, are you telling us? Um, the the last. Update will have been formally struck at uh, 31st of March last year, and in terms of the the, the update on the the previous year's outcomes delivery plan, and come the end of March this year, there'll be performance against the last 12 months. Well, is it on this point or can no, I no, it, no, carry on. I come in at the end. I found my question again. It was working <laughs> in the back of my head. Okay. No problem. I just want to check for my own information. The draft will come to this committee before. It's not a draft anymore, I'm, ass I'm assuming. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to the executive office, because obviously they have a timetable they're working through, mm -hmm. so we, we'll talk to them about what's the sort of the right time to, to share the, the draft with you. Yeah, I just think, just given some of the questions that Pat has just asked, it would be important for the committee to yeah. really delve into the figures and before we see that draft, so we know what we're looking for and what we, yeah. what we might want to suggest Gwen as actions. If we're not going to be able to change the indicators, we need to be able to have some influence on the on the actions. So, uh, next, Doug. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, Jane, Jane, thank you for, for, for that. Um, interesting, the, the respect uh, index. I remember the committee in, in uh, two, 2016, uh, Paul was the chair, and we had quite a discussion about this index because nobody knew how to create an index. And actually, the index that you have there is actually just the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey. That's all it is. If you go to the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, and the figures are exactly the same. Uh, and likewise, if you go to the percentage of population who believe their cultural identity is respected by society, is also pulled from the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey. So actually, those two indicators could actually be combined as a statistic, but that statistic has just been taken from the Life and Times survey. It's not, it's not been taken through any sort of mechanics through the Department for Justice to say this is what we want to look at, this is what we need it to look at, these are the things that are important to us. We've basically just got the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey to say we do a survey and this is what we found. It doesn't, it doesn't really match with, 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 with me. So I think, you know, and maybe, and maybe I'm being really unfair, but, but 
I, I, maybe it's just a comment I'm making, Ken, but, but I, I think that needs to be re-looked at, those indicators, you know, whether or not they should be combined. But certainly we should be setting the parameters, or the Department of Justice should be setting the parameters about what we want to gain from that, as opposed to me, very briefly, when you started talking, um, Googling and, and finding the, the, the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, which mm. is the figures I've taken from. And I suppose, comment on that, and for, for fear for putting myself, is as we look to the longer term PFG, and there's an opportunity over the next 12 months to shape um, A, the actions, and B, potentially the, the indicators, that's certainly something that we'll, we'll, we'll take away and no doubt work with the committee on as we develop that. And, and I, think, I think we do, because, because as, a, as a committee who's scrutinising <coughs> Justice, who wants to see what the, the attitudes are out there in regards to the respect index to, to <coughs> in, improve the, the outcomes, then the parameters for that needs to be set by the Department of Justice, not just to go to some survey and sort of say, "Well, pluck these out," because yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't match. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, and again, for, for fear of repeating myself, caveat that with the um, there's a not a difficulty, but it, it is difficult sometimes to build the right indicator and it's, it's a case of trying to work with what information we can get but absolutely in that context we, we continue and, to do and, that. And, and here's the reason why I raise it because if I look at this it says that this, the survey involved 1,200 face-to-face interviews with adults aged 18 years and over. What about the 18 years and under? Mm-hmm. You know so, so it, to, to me it just doesn't match what we should be we should be having as, a, as, a, as an indicator. Okay well, we'll, we'll I will absolutely take if that comment take a, away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's all. Th- thanks. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you. I think it might be worthwhile the committee actually looking at is there anything in terms of best practice out there on how to do this? And we'll let Rachel take the lead on that. She's, she's <laughs> done this in a former life. Um, I just think that it is important because I, I know even from my time on the placing board, we had similar kind of issues around the, the surveys and how difficult it is to actually yeah. get the right information rather than just information. Yeah. And, and I accept that that's really, really difficult. So it's yeah. not something that I'm saying, you know, you, you need to go and get that right. I think we all have our part to play in it. And I think probably that's what Doug's alluding to here, that we do all of our part. But if the committee could, if there was a way of us trying to look at is there best practice, I would um, <coughs> suggest that the department might. Oh, I, 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 and I'm we, sure we he's that, no, yeah. no I'm equally that's really it. happy to engage in those separate conversations if it's useful on some of the, the, the more detailed stuff if, uh, outside the committee. No, I, if that's I think helpful. it's important, and if we have ideas, and, and, and whilst I said it in jest, and mm-hmm. if, if we have ideas, if there are people who have experience or have some knowledge that would be helpful to this committee, I do think that it's important that that's brought forward, and um, we'll certainly impart whatever we, whatever we get out of Rachel with the department. <laughs> Um, Gordon, you had a question. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. I think most of the points have been covered. Speaking up justice, uh, indicator has, has already been mentioned. I think, um, you know, since I've been on this committee, just new since the, the Assembly restarted, uh, it, it's been talked about a lot, it's about the speeding up of justice, something I wasn't overly aware of, to be honest, before, having been involved before in this committee. You think, will you expect uh, a greater increase in the performance on that issue in the next few years? Yes. Um, As I mentioned, uh, over the past 12 months, we've seen um, improvement in that area. Um, We have internal management information. So although the figure, I think, was 167 at the end of last, for the average time, at the end of last year, um, we know that that has improved um, over the last number That's of months. That's one of the recent ones here, up to 2019. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll be publishing the figure to the end of March 2020. Um, well, NISRA will publish it over the summer. But we know from internal management information, I think we, we've had our fourth or maybe fifth quarter of improvement since then. Um, so that one is moving in the right direction. Um, and I firmly expect that the March 2020 figure will be significantly better than the, the 167. So there are, <coughs> there are good ways of measuring it. Performance in relation to speeding up justice, there are good measurements out there. Yeah, that was one of the ones that we put an awful lot of work into in terms of developing the indicator. So we, yeah. we've developed a new data set that measures the average speed of the system um, from the, the point of arrest through to the point of court disposal and breaks it into a number of stages. And that really helps us focus on where the, the problem areas are. So that one has really helped us um, improve that indicator, albeit we know there is 
even though the overall indicator is improving, there are particular areas like summons cases, for example, that we need to work on to, to improve performance more. I think, you know, the public perception of the speed of justice is, is not good. You know, and I think it really does need to be challenged and, and driven forward. The points have been made there by Duke about um, respect. You know, how, how do you measure the respect uh, <coughs> indicator? How does it actually work? We're all very much aware of all these initiatives, <coughs> TBUC and the Community Relations Council, Peace 4, millions of pounds have been spent. You know, have you have you looked at the evaluation of a lot of these programmes, or, or is that a, a factor in it? Um, that certainly uh, underpins what actions you're going to be taking forward in the future. Those programmes specifically sit on the Executive Office side, and I know from speaking with Executive Office colleagues, um, they absolutely look at those programmes and the evaluations to inform their actions. I think that comes back to the, the, the point your, your, your colleague made. Um, trying to get a, an overarching one indicator for all of those yeah. multifaceted, complex things is very difficult, and it's something we'll continue to, to, to work on. Like uh, <clears throat> tackling paramilitarism and criminality and organised crime, obviously it's the police and you know the, the feedback from them, their figures and outcomes and are those uh, have those been looked at as part of this or? Yeah, the, the, well, certainly in, in terms of the actions and the outcome delivery plan and actions for the the, the, the program for government for next year that we're drafting, those are very much um, key actions in that plan. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Gordon Paul. Yeah, just thank you very much for allowing me to come in. The question might not even be yours, but why, why are the baseline years different? I'm going to take the easy answer and say that was a NISRA thing. Yes. Um, and that no doubt goes back to the availability and robustness of data at particular points in time. Yeah, so you can understand why, yeah. Yeah. Understand why cynical people in this committee might think well, you're, just, <laughs> you're just gearing these measurements up. Uh, so you're giving us a baseline year of 16, whereas you really do have the data for 15, and that gives you a really bad score. You understand how a question like that could be posed? I can understand how a question like that would be posed, and I suppose my, my response to that question, to give you comfort, would be that NISRA very much sat as an and sit as an independent body across all departments. So the departments weren't able to say we want to pick that number for that one and that number for the other one. NISRA independently sat and said, here are the figures we're using. In fact, I think for one of them we actually um, with NISRA they, they changed the year, which made it worse for the department. So mm -hmm. I, I can assure you that that's totally independently done. And, and, and you can see that whilst that may be independently done, us not having the full picture panoramic view well skew measurements. So even as we go on and continue this journey, will that baseline year always be on record and always be seen? And then also, as the years go for on, there'll be in between years that we'll want to measure. So where we can see spikes and dips. And then we can ask the questions around why do we have the sp spike, why do we have the dip? Um, so that will paint a bigger picture, fuller picture, yeah. uh, by having all the years in a, in a data set. And I think we will keep, and again, subject and desert, we'll keep pointing back to those baseline years. But absolutely, if we want to see specific patterns across specific years, uh, that information will absolutely be available. Yeah. And, and of course, the, the programme for government, whilst it's high level and there's outcomes which are aspirations for any government department, and you have the indicators, which is basically the measurement tools. Mm -hmm. We still have to see the doing. We still have to see the plans that will make things better yeah. uh, and, and, and fulfil the aspirations. So we want to get to a position where we can see a budget line along the programme for government, but we also want <coughs> to see an action plan along the programme for government in order that we so you're justifying policies and along I, the programme for government. And I think it's sort of touching on that um, for each action. Uh, we're tasked with publishing uh, an action report card, and that report card um, addresses those three questions that I touched on in my opening comments. So, how much are we doing? Uh, how well are we doing? I suppose the most important question is anyone better off? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Paul. Um, do any other members have any comments? I just want to thank you for your presentation. I think that um, we all as members probably have a bit of work to do before, before you come back in front of us to, to make sure that we have all of the information that we need. But thank you for your presentation and for answering the questions. And hopefully we'll see you again with the, dra with the draft. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you. Just for members' information, Chris has imparted a, a wee bit of um, knowledge with me. Th there is actually information in a previous paper around um, stats around the average time taken to complete criminal cases. So whenever we're looking at all of this, um, we look at that as well because it's the actual stats rather than what you have here, which is the average, which is not really giving you any information, to be fair, <coughs> and I think it's the stats that we need and for us to have the, a good enough knowledge to be able to question in the way we, which we would need to then, I think that would be helpful. So we will look at that whenever we're looking at this. Is, is that okay, Christine? Yes, so the stats are quite detailed. Um, it's across different courts, but it's also you can track the pattern and it gives you a much better picture of what's going on. Okay. Um, just in terms, I know there were a number of questions in your memo, Christine, yes. to be fair, I think I'm... I'm I mean, we can send those to the department, but given that they're not going to change the indicators, I'm not sure of the the value. They probably are something that we should be holding on to, although for the for the, for the next, future, yeah. the strategic yeah. one. So I think that it, you know it is something that we need to to keep in mind anyway. Because <laughs> it's, it's maybe not going to be relevant, but the actions will be something that I would think we can have an impact on. So that's where something we need to be thinking about as a committee going forward. So we're now on uh, agenda item five, the proposed LCM, Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Bill, and uh, the Departmental Briefing. Just to refer members to pages 38 to 47 of the meeting pack um, for relevant papers, and that includes a memo from the clerk, which highlights the issues, paragraph six. Six at uh, page thirty-nine that members may wish to explore. Um, Joe Wilson is going to outline the proposals for the LCM, and then we can ask some questions. And just to advise, obviously Hans Hard will be recording this. So thank you, Joe, for coming to the committee and becoming a regular fixture. <laughs> um, so we'll let you. Yep. Um, if you've had an opportunity to read the paper, I don't propose to say very much, mainly because this bill is actually quite a brief bill with only two substantive clauses. And the first clause um, implements in domestic law three key conventions. And those conventions already apply in the UK, but they apply because of the uh, UK's um, membership of the EU. So under the terms of the withdrawal agreement, they continue to apply until the end of the transitional period, but this bill will, make this, will take the steps um, to implement these conventions in UK domestic law because the UK is going to take steps to participate in the conventions in its own right. And then the second um, substantive clause um, in the bill is to allow um, a clearly defined power to make regulations to implement any future international agreements in the private, in the private international field. And as respects Northern Ireland, um, the power would be for a Northern Ireland department or the Secretary of State acting with the consent um, of a Northern Ireland department. And the private international field is a very technical area, it's highly specialised, and the, any regulations made under this clause wouldn't actually be able to do anything in terms of the international agreement itself, which will have been carefully negotiated by all the contracting parties. But the regulations will give the convention the force of law and they will also make sort of techy procedural things like designating which court an application would go to, who's got the right to appeal. It's quite technical and the types of um, uh, provisions that we would expect these regulations to make. Um, in order for the UK to participate in the three Hague Conventions in its own right, there are certain steps that have to be taken, and the timelines for those are actually set by the Hague Conference on Private International Law. And if you want a convention to enter into force in your country, you've got to do certain things within three months of the entry into force date. So if the UK wants to participate in the three Hague Conventions by the end of the transitional period, it's got to take some steps by the end of September, and it needs this bill to do that. So the Ministry of Justice are working on the basis that they will have royal assent for this bill by early September, and second reading is expected on the 17th of March. 
I'm afraid to say, just happy to take questions. Yeah, that's fair enough. Joe, thank you very much for, for giving us uh, an outline on that. I um, suppose just for my own part, I have some concern that we would be given the power to Westminster to make regulations, you know, yeah, it would be with afterwards, which yeah. and I know it says Westminster or here, yeah. but who would decide that and why? If it can be done here, would we give that power to Westminster? Do we do we have to leave that in, or can it, it not? It be? can only be done with our consent. So the Secretary of State can only act in respect of Northern Ireland with the consent of a Northern Ireland department, and this similar provision will apply in respect of the Scottish ministers. Yeah. If the Secretary of State were to act on behalf of Scotland. Um, this is a technical area of law, and most of the law that applies domestically within the UK is actually um, applies on a UK-wide basis. So obviously we would consider each um, time, consider it on its own sort of merits as to whether or not it makes more sense. Um, for example, if we don't want to make parallel amendments to a UK-wide statute, then it may make more sense for the statute reader that the Secretary of State would act on behalf of Northern Ireland, but it would only be with our consent, with the Northern Ireland Department's consent, yeah. and we would take into account all the different issues that normally would be taken into account in deciding whether or not we should legislate here or it should be done on a UK-wide basis. I'm sure the other members will have questions on this as well, but just for my own part, Yes, it would be only with the department's consent, but we're the committee. How do we, where's our part in that? Where, where do we get the opportunity to ensure that we're content that the department is doing the right thing by giving consent? So not to say that we would have any yep. issues with it, but we don't know. We this don't know unless, the unless these things are in front of us. So This would be the type of decision which we would expect the minister to engage with the, with the committee on. But, but how do we enforce that? that? That would be my concern. You know, you are relying on, and we're not obviously just talking about the, yeah. the current minister, yeah. so it's it's not yeah. clearly not anything in relation to the current minister. But anybody who might be in that position as as a minister, we're relying on the minister to engage with us. Do you, does the minister have to engage with the committee, or it's that or that would be at the minister's discretion? I know it would be the yeah. smart thing yeah. to engage yeah. with the committee, well, but yeah. Obviously, if, if, if time allows, then the normal procedures would apply and the normal engagement procedures would apply. Okay. <clears throat> um, we have a number of members who want to, to ask questions. Paul? Yeah, surely, if, even if uh, was, and again, I, I'm, I've read this and I'm, I'm quite content with the whole thing and relaxed about it uh, because there'll be. There will be international agreements that really only the sovereign government can really mm -hmm. negotiate yeah. and then second of all implement. Yeah. Um, but will it still not be the case that even if Westminster implements something that we would need an LCM here? Um, At least if consent motion. Mm -hmm. Not for subordinate. Mm -hmm. that's, no. that's the issue you see and, and that's where my concern is. Even in relation to, sorry Paul, even in relation to, I know what you're saying about the engagement with the committee but there's nothing then the assembly would have no role and there's nothing to i suppose enforce the minister to to take the committee's view yeah. of it so i understand joe that that in terms of your chef you might be looking at and saying that in the department's mind this is very straightforward and shouldn't be an issue but i have to respect the the working of the committee and the entire assembly. So, sorry, Paul, do you just want to finish your point? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I take your point because I, I did think there was going to be a, a process of LCM uh, with regards to getting the, the approval of the House uh, on, on all measures that would be changed. So that's something, yeah, we, we the principle of that we should be exploring. I still bring, bring, I still bring the committee back to my point whereby these, these are international law agreements. Yeah. So really... The sovereign government really should be negotiating and engaging with another sovereign government in order to implement them within the whole jurisdiction of a country. And to have differential in this case may well then create, uh, well, will create uh, two tiers or three tiers even with regards to all re regions. Um, so I'll be interested to know: Are there any other international laws similar to this that actually are enacted differently in Scotland compared to England? Say. Mm -hmm. Well, 
in my field, so it would depend on the, each domestic legal system. So the yes. Scottish legal system is slightly different. Yes. It's modelled on the civil law basis, so they might have to do sort of little tiny supporting things differently. Yes. But the actual convention, as a matter of international law, if it applies in the UK, we all have to yes. comply with it. And again, that's international law. Yeah. yeah. And um, for the most part, um, any future agreements in this field will be subject to um, the Constitutional um, Constitu Constitutional Reform Act, and um, Parliament will have an opportunity to um, debate ratification of the treaty. So there is scrutiny at that level. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask some that maybe were well wide of the field, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The Istanbul Convention is that something similar? And um, how would that be implemented? In? I'm sorry. No, I no that's fine. Right. No, I, I, I probably knew it was left field before <laughs> I asked it. No, that's not me finish. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Rachel? Um, my questions have basically been answered. It was just about um, how we're measuring consent, and it's the department's consent, so it's the minister. Um, just to confirm that the exact same process has gone through the Scottish Parliament. In and uh, this has already been agreed by Scottish Parliament in terms of having this... Um, the implementation of the agreements bill and the, the way in which it's being done there. Sorry, I'm uh, no, no, you grant. Um, has it been changed in any way through Scotland? No, Scotland um, are still in the process of um, the trying process. to okay. um, obtain the consent. All right. Sort of the same stage as us. Same. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, that actually was going to be my next proposal. I think mm -hmm. I would like to see what the other assemblies, committees' views are before we would. Um, take a definitive position on this. So, I mean, we don't have to take a definitive position on it today. So, are the committee happy that we do that? That we we request what some information from the other assemblies as to what their committee's approach to it is. And because I understand what Joe's saying in terms of, you know, we would be different or we'd be outside what other assemblies are doing, but we don't know that yet because they might actually not not be content. I mean, they may well be yeah, content, and yeah. that's. But I, I just would like the committee to get an opportunity to to find out what the other assemblies committees view. Uh, how, long do, how long do you reckon, Chair? Yeah. Um, I don't know, just so that we're up against it time-wise in time terms of... And, and, and and how tight of it, up against it in terms of how much time? I mean, if we were to come back to this, what's the latest we could come back to this? Um... The very, very latest that we would need the legislative consent motion would be early May. I think we could definitely be coming back much sooner than that, to be fair. I don't think we need there needs to be any big delay with it, because I, it, it's, it's that information. And then just in terms of even if the department can come back to us with sort of confirmation on whether what their view is of it being changed to rather than having Westminster included there, whether we would look to it be in the Assembly or give us a very strong rationale as to why not do it that way. Um, and we just wouldn't have the time to get an Assembly bill in place for September. Well, I'm, I'm saying we would certainly come back to you well in advance of, of May. Yeah. I, I don't. Yeah, but if we didn't I have wouldn't. a legislative consent motion, sorry, we didn't have a legislative consent motion. We, we simply wouldn't be able to have a bill in place for September. No, no, I, I understand that, but I still think that the committee would like to have as much information as mm -hmm. as possible before we would give that, and we will not leave you tied to the wire. Thank Could you. I just ask a question, Chair? Paul and and Gordon will have to hold Paul given no, no, <laughs> to, to account okay, on that leaving okay, you tight no. the wire. I'm only joking. But it's obviously it's Paul is the chair. It's, ju it's just on this issue. If, yeah, go ahead, Pat. If it's okay with Gordon. No, go ahead. Um, just in terms of uh, the not being able to get the legislation through by September, what would the repercussions of that be? Um, it would mean that Northern Ireland wouldn't would be in breach of its obligations because where the UK has got an international obligation and it's in the devolved field, the responsibility for complying with that is with the Northern Ireland administration. <coughs> um, I'm going to suggest that the, the clerk will 
be in contact with the department around um, time scales to ensure that we don't put you under any pressure. It cer certainly wouldn't be our intention, but I do think it's still important for the committee to have as much information as possible <coughs> to make the right um, decision in relation to this, Doug. Uh, sure, thank you. And, and I'm kind of with you on that to make sure we've got enough information. I'm, I'm just concerned about what extra information we're going to get because we could very well sit here saying, well, let's see what Scotland's doing. Scotland could be dithering and then we wouldn't get anything back from Scotland. You know, nothing's to say they're any further ahead than we are, that their decision is going to be any different from ours. You know, I just, I'm just, I mean, if we're going to delay it, I think we, we, we really need to give it a time frame of a delay. You know, we, we, need to, we need to have decided by, you know, the end of March. Or, you know. Well, I suppose that's the point of, of the, yeah. the correspondence between the department and the clerk. We, we will give a, a time scale. I don't think we need to give a time scale right here, right now, but we will give you a time so there won't be any... Um, but just on due delay, and even I, th I think you're right around the, the conversation with the other assemblies. We won't be led by them, but if they, if we can get some information, because there may be issues that they've that they highlight that we haven't spotted well, as well. I, so I think it's important that we absolutely sure, and, and 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 I'm absolutely happy with that. But just to put on record, I mean, I'd be happy enough to go with this now today. Um, but just That's to put it on record, but you know, if we decide to, to wait and get more information, information doesn't hurt as long as it doesn't hurt the process. I have no problem. Yeah, yeah oh, go and ahead. so that I'm clear, this will not halt or stop the the progress of, of forming a uh, LCM in mm -hmm. the coming weeks. You can still go off now today and carry on with your work and progress, and then it's really for the committee to decide what we think of it. Uh, so it's yeah. really a piece of work for us. Yeah. Uh, it won't affect the department, so I'm content to, to allow the the, uh, the committee time to assess it. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, I mean, if the committee's content, what we'll do is we'll make contact and we can update you next week on the information we have, whether they've looked at it mm -hmm. or they're in the process of it or whatever, so we can keep it moving. Up. So the 15 working days then, will that won't stop the clock ticking? in terms of scrutiny of the memorandum? It starts ticking as soon as you lay yeah. your LC. Okay. Yeah. So if we let tomorrow? If you let tomorrow, yeah. then the committee has 15 working days to complete its report. That working days does not include Saturdays, Sundays, bank holidays or recess dates. Can I, can I, ask, the chair, can I ask the chair, when are you intending to let? Um, I'll have to. Yeah, but you're not going to let tomorrow. Well, we've got executive approval to lay it. Yeah, but the minister surely can hold off and give the committee time. If you, ha if you if you're not under any pressure from Westminster with regards to timing, and it's the 14, 14 day rule or fifteen 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 day rule. So we've got Easter, will kick in. St Patrick's Day will kick in. Yeah. Well, I suppose if we could ask you then to go back and see what your timeline looks like, just to see what wriggle room we do have as a committee to assess this because ultimately um, whilst I'm content with this if the department lays it LCM after the committee showing any sort of sign of shakiness it may not work out well for the department um, even though I'm supportive so, so there'll have to be the committee will have its place here uh, so if, if you could come back with a time scale and to give us some sort of indication of wriggle room then we'll, we'll try our best to be as efficient with time as possible. Well, that's really what Christine's going to do in terms yeah. of, <coughs> of yeah. her contact to ensure that there isn't any on due delay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming to the committee. Thank you. Okay. So we're clear on the way of moving forward then? In your contempt? Yes, we'll we'll check the position um, across the other legislatures. Um, we'll update you next week. Um, at the end of the day, the department, if they decide to lay, lay the LCM in the meantime, but they've got a clear message from the committee, so and we'll work through those time skills. So that's thank you. Okay. okay, members, our next agenda, agenda item six: simplifying the legal aid approval process for engagement of expert witnesses and family. Proceedings in the Magistrates' Court draft consultation on a pilot scheme. I refer members to pages 49 to 78 of the, their pack. So, the Department is proposing to undertake a two month consultation on proposals for a pilot scheme to allow psychiatrists and psychologists to be instructed in public law proceedings 
in the Family Proceedings Court without having to get prior authority from the legal services agency providing they work within a fixed hourly rate and within a cap of hours. The proposals are aimed at standardising hourly rates and speeding up access to justice. Um, so the NA Audit Office and Public Accounts Committee both raised this issue of divergence of hourly rates paid in 2016. So obviously <coughs> this is a wee bit out of date. We're, we're a number of years behind. So my, I'm proposing that in moving forward, if members are content to note the intention of the department undertake the consultation, that the only thing we would be saying is that we would like to see it this process uh, to happen in as speedy a manner as possible, because obviously we already are out of date by a number of years. Paul? Yeah, so we've had so many reports, including audit reports, to say that this is a good thing. But yet the department is going to consult on a pilot scheme. And I think that the pilot scheme itself would inform the department. Yeah. So I would worry that here's a department who can't offer up any costs. They can't tell us. They can't uh, retrieve data on the costs to date. Now, this is probably one of the reasons why Anne Doug raised this call. He's got why the accounts are qualified. But surely, how, how do they know that it will estimate savings of 16,000 when they don't know how much it costs in the first place? It's bonkers. And I, I would have a worry that this is just long grass stuff. This is just kicking the ball in the touch. We're having a consultation on a pilot scheme. The pilot scheme will run, and then we we'll might need another pilot scheme because we're just not sure yet. And it will go on, I'll be piloted to death. I think this has to happen now. I think we've got enough recommendations for reports. Uh, you know, they're putting in control costs and cap. Who, who's going to respond to this consultation other than the people who may lose a few pounds? Uh, so I, 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 I'm worried and concerned why, why we need a consultation. And I, I don't mean to get a, a, a presentation because it would just take too, up too much time in the committee, I'm sure, but I think we should go back and ask the question, why are you consulting on a pilot scheme? Why not just run out a pilot scheme and see what happens? And, and why, why or oh why can they not give us any sort of robust Co uh, costs. Why can they not retrieve any data on this issue? How do they know it's, an e it's even a problem? It's bonkers. It really is. For them not to give us any sort of assessment in costs is, is remarkable. It really is. Now, again, that's, that's the whole legal aid stuff. That's, that's just where it all sits. But that's, that's how, how stupid it is. And then how, do, how can they come up with a cost saving of 16, 16k? Uh, to me, it just is bonkers. So, uh, if we can write back to the department and ask them those questions. I'm content to move forward in that way. I don't have any I issues. I, I, just, I have a number no, of questions, like Paul, with, yeah. with regard, especially with the lack of data availment of, of, of payments made to experts, and then where on earth these the hours have come from, and the, the payments as well, you know. Do, do we know that those hours that are they're limited to a cap or are long enough? Is that the time that it's actually needed? Where is this all come from? There isn't enough for me enough information mm -hmm. there, and but and certainly um, the, the the screaming um, obvious thing is that we have no data on costs, but we're going to save sixteen grand. It's it doesn't really add up to me. Can I ask a question? Do the department have to consult on this? Is that why they're consulting on it? Um, I don't know. We need to ask them. Um, I mean, I, I think, think that's normally silly. they are required to consult. Could be like Omar. They have had pilot schemes in the past, and I'm not sure whether they consulted on the those pilot schemes. So, yeah, but normally it's a pilot scheme. Blown. I'm not sure if you, yeah. if you have to consult or not. No. But I think that's I think the first thing we can quickly ask. And if that's why, then that's our answer, and there's mm -hmm. nothing can be done about it. But if they don't have to, I mean, is there a recommendation coming from this? Obviously, we're asking the question, but are if they were to come back and say they don't have to consult, is this committee content that they wouldn't consult because it's only a pilot programme, or <coughs> the committee prefer just to leave that until we get the response back? I would, I would prefer to leave it until we get an answer yeah. from them, yeah. just to yeah. make an informed decision. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. That's OK. Absolutely, I agree. So hopefully we'll get a response back to that quite quickly, because the questions are straightforward enough. Okay, if members are content, then that's how we'll 
proceed with that and we'll move on to agenda item 7. The proposals for the new organised crime offences draft consultation and that's in your PACS page 80 to 135. The department has carried out a review of the current law relating to serious and organised crime and is proposing to consult on the new policy proposals to enhance law enforcement's ability to tackle serious organised crime. Um, the proposals include introducing a statutory definition of serious and organised crime, introducing new offences and tariffs and legislating for aggravated offences. The Minister has indicated that she is content for an eight-week consultation on the proposals to take place, subject to any views, comments or points that we may have. <coughs> And the department will provide a further briefing on the findings of the consultation and revise policy proposals and the next steps once the consultation is completed and responses have been collated and reviewed. So, are members content that the consultation takes place? Agreed. And just in relation to that, obviously, I mean, I'm sure we'll all have our own views on this, and, and, and I suppose. I'm happy to take any comments, but there's nobody here to question, and I don't think there'll be a committee response to this. <coughs> I would imagine that we probably all will respond with any issues that we have anyway to the consultation. Um, so if members are content, sure, no, if you, if you have it, sorry, I, I was going to say if you have any points that are views that you <coughs> want to to raise whilst having said all I've said, I don't want to cut off anybody's opportunity to raise them because we can make those views made known yeah, to I, the I th department. I think the only thing I was going to say, um, Chair, is you know they, they're using organised crime in, in that document and, and then the, there's a brief description of paramilitarism as well and the two are absolutely linked together. You know, you, you can't you can't take one with it without the other. I'd like to know um, this new offence, is it is it linking the two? Is it is it something that you know, I mean, if you if you're going to, for example, let me try and explain that. If, so, if you're going to, if you arrest somebody who's who, who's paramilitarism doing organised crime through paramilitarism, then he goes to court and he's charged within court. Is he then charged as somebody who's involved in organised crime, or is he charged as somebody who's who's involved in paramilitarism? Do, do you see what I'm, yes, I'm getting at? Because the sentencing outcomes will be different. Content that we ask the department to, yeah, to clarify on that. Yeah, please, yeah. Okay, committee content that we ask them to clarify on that, and then just obviously it will come back to us after the the period of consultation. So, if members are happy enough, we'll move on. Unless anybody else any comments, okay. So, agenda item eight then is the correspondence, and that's at pages one three seven to two 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 of your meeting pack and ten to forty seven of your table pack. Um, I'm just going to draw attention to a couple of items of correspondence, and that does not mean that you can't raise any issues you have in relation to the deal, to the other items. So feel free to to raise any issues you do have. So there's correspondence from Action for Children requesting a meeting with the committee to discuss the challenges for children and young people, families generally, and justice-related issues in particular. So are you content that we offer an informal meeting with the Chairperson, Deputy Chair, and any members that wish to attend. Great, yeah. Okay, enough. Item four then is at 165 and 166 of the meeting pack, and that's La Dolce Vida. And members would probably recall, I think Martina raised it here in the committee, there. it's around parental alienation. And again, they want to meet with the committee. So I think the same process where Chair and Deputy Chair will offer a meeting, and any members who wish to attend will be free to. To do so? Yeah. Um, so, item eight then, an invitation from the Judicial Appointments Commission to a roundtable event on Wednesday, 6th of May, from 1 to 3 pm. Um, if members can just let Christine know if you wish to attend that event and she can let them know if that's okay. Okay. And item one uh, on your table pack is a copy of the audit office report on entry on duty um, for 
the police and prison service and obviously it raised a, a number of issues not least around the cost but there are deeper issues than the cost and, and I'm saying that as a previous member on the policing board and, and we were actually had started to look into those issues just as just before I came off the board um, I would suggest and, and members are free to ha make any comment in relation to this or just wait for us to do this I think that we should write to both the policing board and the minister asking what actions they intend to take and particularly around any regulatory or legislative change that might need to be carried out in order to, to address some of the issues that have been raised. Again, only from my own past experience on the policing board, I know that a working group has been set up to look specifically, and obviously that's only dealing with the, the PSNA end of it. It doesn't deal with the, the prison staff, but um, that obviously will come under the department so they can advise us what they intend to look at in relation to that. Are members content that we write to both and ask what their intentions are? Yep, great. <clears throat> okay. Chair, can I suggest yeah. we copy the letter to the Public Accounts Committee, um, given it's a Northern Ireland Audit Office report, just so that they're aware of what this committee is doing? Yeah, I'm happy that we do that. So, no other comments then? And item two then, at pages 42 to 45 of the table pack. Correspondence from the department informing the committee of changes that the minister intends to make on, well, initially at least on a, an administrative basis to the access NA disclosure process to prevent further challenges following a Supreme Court ruling. So the, the minister is removing the multiple conviction rule, which she believes will achieve the element of proportionality that the court considered was missing from the process. The change in policy will have an impact on the criminal record information now disclosed. However, the Minister does not consider that the safeguarding of vulnerable groups will be compromised by this change and she will bring forward the relevant secondary legislation which will be subject to an affirmative procedure as soon as possible to provide the Committee and the Assembly the appropriate level of scrutiny. Um, the letter has been included in your table pack because whilst it was only received yesterday, it's going to be coming to the Assembly on Monday, so we just thought that you know members needed to be aware of it. However, obviously, since we only got it in our table pack, we haven't had a lot of time to consider it. So if you're content, we will put this back into the papers for next week for any further discussion in relation to it, if, if members are happy enough for that. Um, <coughs> and that does not again preclude anybody that wants to raise any points today in the meeting. You're you're welcome to do so. So I'll take it that we're we're happy to proceed in that way. Item three then, pages forty six and forty seven of your table pack, a letter from the Minister informing the committee that she's appointed the six new members to the policing board. Um and that was put out in a press release, as far as I know yesterday. I know that um, I got an email in relation to it. So, are members content to note? And is there any issues they want to raise in relation to it? Members are content, okay. Just from, from my own point of view, um, obviously the Secretary of State reopened the pool. And I did ask the department a question around that previously. I don't really feel like I got an answer to it, and if members are happy, I would like to write again to the minister and ask what was the rationale behind reopening the pool, because their legal cases have come out of that, which are going to cost money out of the justice budget. So was it worth reopening and opening themselves up to that challenge, and why did they do it? What was the rationale? Because we've never got a, a rationale, and I know the policing board wrote to the Secretary of State and didn't get a rationale either. So are members content that we do that? It's simply for the rationale, I'm not asking to backtrack. We're not going to be replacing them or, or doing anything like that, but it is about what the rationale. What did you say? Sorry, it opened up a whole issue. The, the pool was um, reopened by the Secretary of State without giving any rationale as to why she did it. There was, a, there was a pool of people which had only just been interviewed right, okay. um, and mm -hmm. could, should have been appointable, but for some reason... The Secretary of State reopened that pool without giving any reason for doing it. 
Ray, do you want clarification on it? Uh? Just one clarification as to what the rationale was behind it. No, that's granted. Um, and it'll probably, be, in fairness, be for the Justice Minister to ask the Secretary of State because it wasn't a decision that was taken here. It was, a, it was the Secretary of State. So, um, if you're happy to go ahead with that, Chairperson's business. I don't have any. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Apologies. Um, just if you're content that we action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. Yep. Yeah, okay. And I don't have anything under chairperson's business. Right, Christine? And just want to ask members if you have any other business that you, in Gruella? Well, our last item of business is to say a form farewell to Pat, who is, this is his last Justice Committee, not his last committee meeting, just his last Justice Committee Couldn't meeting. Hack it. Couldn't hack it. <laughs> and uh, Pat's going to be replaced by Gemma Dolan. So I don't know how to break it, Jess, but it looks like the women are taking over the Justice Committee. There's, there's, no, justice. there's no justice. <laughs> there's no justice. Well, so Pat, thank you for your participation thank you for in, the, in the committee and <laughs> look forward to seeing our, our new member and Paul can't wait. Gemma joins us on another I, committee. Just say all the best to Pat. Uh, I uh, am on the finance committee with Gemma, so she'll be sick of my face. This is all over, but uh, yeah, we welcome her onto the team. She'll be part of the team and she'll do well. Thank you. Okay, if members have nothing else, then I declare the meeting closed and our next meeting. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.